Hi, it's Chris Severton, director of All Cheerleaders Die and Monstrous, and you're listening to the Horror Squad podcast. Hello, welcome back to the Horror Squad podcast. This is episode number 226. Tonight we're talking about The Fog, John Carpenter's movie. Uh, we're only two man show tonight. We got Steve and myself, Todd. Joe is working like 16 hour days. He's tired. We're letting him sleep in because he's all tuckered out still. Steve, what's going on? Uh, not too much. Not too much. We also have an interview this week, possibly. <laughs> uh, so stick to the end for that. It's with Chris Sievertson who is here to plug uh, Monstrous, which is a new movie that's releasing this week over on uh, VOD and theaters, and it stars Christina Ricci. So um, I'll talk about it on my watch, but uh, yeah, stick out to the end of the episode and listen to that interview. Other than that, uh, not much. No, not much. So us, just two of us again, it seems that we're, uh, it's like fucking Charlie and Chocolate Factory in here. (laughs) Uh, we're losing some every, every week so we have to sing a song for each host we lose <laughs> right. get our oompa loompas get, <laughs> when you go to text fresh frightmare right. you spend two thousand dollars <laughs> right i uh hung out with asa this weekend it was freaking cool we got some uh nice. fucking great oh my god great texas barbecue i mean i'd love barbecue to begin with Texas has the best food. I've said this numerous times, but the barbecue, oh my God. Got some brisket, some sausage, some ribs, which is my favorite go-to is ribs. Fall off the bone, melt in your mouth. Oh man, just like, excellent, excellent. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I saw the pictures on Discord and I was oh, yeah. like, oh my God, you're killing me here. <laughs> oh. yeah, it's awesome. like, I could eat it probably weekly, but that would yeah. be bad for your stomach. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah excellent. You could, but should you is the other yeah, exactly. the question that uh, we need to ask here. Yeah, for sure. And I will mention one thing. It's not on my what watched. Uh, we will talk about it on our other show, Let's XP Geek and Gaming Podcast. But I did go see um, Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. I won't spoil anything, obviously. I mean, it just came out. But we talked about maybe a year or two ago on this show that apparently it was going to be like a horror version of the MCU. And having seen it now, I can fucking confirm that. Uh, there's a huge debate. I guess going on in uh, probably the US because parents are like furious that it got a PG 13 rating when they feel it should have been an R. So, yeah. Are we talking about like beheadings or something? What's, oh, give me, it's, give me it's, a graphic scene. Oh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of blood and scares and zombies and like full, ghosts. Full penetration. And, yeah, full penetration, of course. <laughs> the FCU does it <laughs> no other way. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like, it's definitely. A Sam Raimi movie, you know, and uh, it's good. It's good to see. It was cool to see uh, the darker side, I guess, of the MCU and getting a little horror injected cool. into it. So that's cool. It's cool that it got like a, a mainstream release too, not like a animated show or something. Yeah, awesome. no, absolutely. It's uh, it's great. So people check it out if you're a fan of horror movies and you're not, you're kind of burnt out on the MCU. Maybe this is one to check out uh, just for the horror aspects. The whole like last, you know, act is basically a horror film. So that's cool. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Hey, um, you want to get into the questions that we got this week? Sure. So you can ask us those questions on social media at the Horror Squad Podcast, or of course on our Discord, where a bunch of people are having great conversations all the time. And uh, it's because of Discord that uh, Todd got to meet Asa. So that's very, very cool uh, that you know we can meet up with some people when we. Uh, yeah, I've actually things. met like, I mean, obviously a lot of cool people online, but like in person. A couple really good buddies back in the Cincinnati area, um, TJ and Brent, which I met through this podcast because they were listening to this podcast, which is awesome. And now Asa, and then hopefully a bunch of other people in the future, like at a con or something, that'd be dope. It's yeah. a really good, really good community. Oh, absolutely. So uh, it's totally free to join. Just send us a message and we'll give you, uh, you know, the access. It's The only reason we do that is because there's... Um, a 24 hour like link so we'd have to post a link every day so we just don't do that so just ask us and we will let you in uh the first series of questions are uh, audio questions so they come from chuck chuck what are your questions what's up horror squad chuck here with a few questions more so we're gonna do hot takes slash fill in the blanks today first off blank is the most underrated horror actor or actress of all time oh that's not really a easy one to just plug right away, huh? I'll go first since I had a little time to think about it. Uh, Do it. Uh, I would say Jeffrey Combs. 
uh, he's been in a lot of big horror movies that are very popular to the people in the horror genre. He's also been in a lot of mainstream stuff. I mean, he's played like 80 characters on Star Trek, but asking like a person who isn't a horror fan who he is, and they probably have no idea. He's just super, he's just one of those actors that's in a lot of stuff. And I like him. Like he's actually, him and Tony Todd are my number ones of people I've seen the most movies of on uh, Letterboxd. And uh, it's crazy. Like he's in a lot of stuff. Like he just appears and like he was in, I still know what you did last summer. You know, he's in the Frighteners. He's in like a bunch of stuff that people don't necessarily associate him with. Um, so yeah, very cool. I, I House on Haunted Hill is another one, the, the remake there. So Jeffrey Combs is my answer. All right, I'll, uh, I'll go along the same lines there. I'll go with Tom Atkins um, from the movie we were talking about tonight. Um, he's in like a bunch of stuff randomly, but mostly just horror stuff, right? And he's like a really good actor. He's, he's got like a strong presence he's like a tough guy but he's also like um charismatic too so i go tommy atkins man he's really good i actually wrote a note in my uh, fog review uh god tom leave some women for the rest of us like he's such Dude, a fucking I, suave I, motherfucker yeah uh halloween three he nails that chick he's nailing everybody yeah. oh, he's Damn so tom. suave man he's just got yeah. like he's just, i don't even think he's particularly that good looking uh he he's just confident. has something he has yeah he has like yeah. a something that's just crazy <laughs> he's the man I, yeah. that's one person i'm really sad i've never gotten to meet i know he still does cons but i mean he's like he's in his 80s i think yeah i met so. him once he's i mean not, yeah nice guy he signed my h3 poster so nice. he's cool hopefully i get the chance uh, while he's still doing cons uh so chuck what is your second question blank is going to turn into the next great franchise blank huh hmm what do we got? I mean, we got Art the Clown. It's got a second movie. Well, I guess if you count the other, the first one, All Hallows Eve. But right. I guess, yeah, let's call it the second movie. See, so Art the Clown. Uh, I don't know, man. Because you would have to go mainstream, right? And that's not exactly mainstream. It could become mainstream. Or not all. You know, some horror films start off kind of mm. lower end and then start getting popular later. So it's possible. Yeah, I'll go with Art. That's a good answer. If if they tone down, you know, I hate saying this because I'm obviously a horror fan, but if they tone down the violence and then they make it more mainstream violence, and because you're not going to have a girl upside down getting chopped through the vagina on on a big screen, so you're right. <laughs> because he's like a creepy character too, like him just like staring. Oh his, man, yeah. His, yeah, when he's just looking at you. That diner doing, scene. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, you've seen all Hallows Eve, right? I know it's a different I actor, have. but yeah, yeah, that's really good too. Mm-hmm. yeah absolutely that, that's it's at a gas station or something or a, like a is it a gas station uh, or, like, or a convenience store like or something that, yeah. Like a, yeah yeah it's definitely a good one as well uh, i'm gonna go something that's not even out yet <laughs> i'm just basing it off what i think it could be and that's uh the new version of the toxic avenger i feel like he's like people in the horror front like know who he is but mainstream people don't but if this new movie comes out and I think it could be popular with both horror and non-horror because it's like a character that's recognizable, uh, it could become a franchise. So I have high hopes. You know, it's uh, produced by the same people who did um, I got a Greasy Strangler. So it's um, Elijah Woods uh, producing that one. So I have high hopes. Do you know who's directing, who's directing it? I don't know. I'll oh, find that. Yeah, hopefully someone good. So while you're looking at that, Chuck, what is your final question? Well, last but not least, Blank is a franchise that never should have went past the first movie. Thanks, guys. Look forward to the episode. Jaws. Mm. Um, the director is of Toxic Avengers, Macon Blair, who directed Green Room. So oh, that's, that's yeah, awesome. that's a good uh, yeah, that's definitely <laughs> yeah, a good resume seriously. right there. Oh, no, he didn't. He didn't. Oh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that was just like his known for was Green Room, but I oh, okay. didn't direct it. Um, let's see. He was not a writer on it either, so he just must have been like a bit role. So, yeah. never mind. <laughs> I said there. <laughs> like, oh, I know, <laughs> okay. yeah. Uh, so he hasn't done anything that you can see that well known. No, just okay. acting. Hmm. Well, hopefully. Uh, yeah, he acted in the green room. I don't remember what the character's name were, but he was Gabe. Yeah, I don't remember the character name yeah. at all. That's like the worst thing with us is character names, though. So. <laughs> um, Kevin Bacon, Peter Dinklage, Elijah Wood. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I think it could be pretty cool. 
so yeah so what do you think is a franchise that never should have gone so jaws that's your jaws for sure yeah i mean two is okay but like it, no we should have ended it at one and then it of course got goofy with three and four yeah as long as we could keep cruel jaws i'm, I'm happy <laughs> <laughs> with hulk hogan with hulk off. hogan yeah <laughs> Uh, that was one of the probably the biggest surprises from movies we reviewed on this podcast. I, I totally went in thinking it'd be the worst movie ever, and it's I, not. It's, I really it's, liked it's it. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm gonna go anything that fucking Full Moon made in the last like 20 years. Uh, Evil Bong, Ginger Dead Man, um, any of those like Killjoy. I, I don't know when Killjoy started, but I, th- I, think, I think Killjoy's more. pretty old. Yeah, just I don't know. Maybe. just they just need to stop you know and they just keep yeah. coming and coming and coming i mean fucking new evil bonks coming out this month so but they won't do puppet master it's like right well i mean there's what 12 of them so i guess yeah we... i guess it's time for a reboot if anything mm-hmm. um all right so thank you chuck for the audio questions so we're gonna go now over to the discord that we were talking about before so the first questions are from uh, michelle she says What's your favorite horror theme song? Ooh. Um, are we talking about like instrumental? Or are we talking about like... Not, uh, yeah, I guess so, right? Like like a theme that plays every time a horror character comes in? I guess I would go Jason's theme song. Or mm-hmm. theme. You know, that's pretty... I mean, you can go Halloween too, Jaws. Or Jaws, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'll go with Jason. Or even... Or even uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, it's a, that's true. That's a good, that's one. good one too. But for, for me, it's probably Halloween. Uh, Michael Myers mm-hmm. is it's just that music. Just I know it's like I feel it's Halloween because now, I mean, obviously the movie, but I only watch. I typically only watch the Halloween movies in October. It's like my go-to, you know, in October every year. So hearing that music always makes me think that it's Halloween season, and I'm that that'll always make me happy. So yeah, it hits hard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and fuck, Carpenter's such a good composer and we'll, we'll talk about that again with the fog uh her next question if you could get dragged into any horror movie which would you pick and which do you think you could realistically survive um i think i could realistically survive a um a scream movie especially yeah. the last one with the weak ass killers right <laughs> um and then what would i want to be dragged into though probably a zombie movie because that's like every horror fan's fantasy to just have impunity and just shooting <laughs> zombies and stuff so like dawn where they're yeah kind of slow cool. and sluggish not, not the fast ones for sure no 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 yeah no, not, not the dawn remake no yeah, yeah for sure uh yeah that, that's probably a good answer and i think that's the same answer for both i'd both like to be in it and uh i think i could survive it because all you have to do is not be an idiot really uh, especially in like dawn of the dead the zombies like eventually just shuffle away if you don't make noise so if you sleep like in a closet and just put your feet at the door and they can get in, it'll basically end there. <laughs> you know, they'll just leave at some point and they're back. I, to being I snore though, Steve. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. So that's going to be a issue. Oh, probably. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I'm sure you can insulate <laughs> you it. Track somehow, me down. You know? <laughs> right. Or even an attic. Yeah. Like, I mean, fucking what's his face in uh, Night of the Living Dead? He had the right idea. You know, you go in the attic, they can't reach you. So you're safe up there. Um, and her last question, do you think being a horror fan would help you survive a horror movie? Or do you think the moment you'd end up making some of the same stupid uh, decisions characters make in the movies? I like that commercial. I don't know if you have in Canada, but when they're, they're doing some like, I forget what it, they're comparing, but it's like a horror movie and the girl's like, or the, some one character's like, let's go hide in the, in the little shack. And they're like, why don't we just get in the running car? Right. And it's, I don't know if you've seen that one. It's like, no, because like they make the stupidest decisions. And um, I think Weezerface actually pointed it out like a year ago where we thought there was a ghost behind you, Steve. Yeah. And I said, shut up. What's behind Steve? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, I think I would be uh, more apt to not fall into like the slasher's tricks or something like that. Mm-hmm. But it comes down basically to what happened at Scream, right? Because you have mm-hmm. the horror fans that still get stuck because you're we're going on the assumption that the killer is going to go through the horror tropes when the killer might be smarter than the horror tropes as well so you have that's true sm- Very you have true. a smarter victim but you also have a smarter killer so it kind of equals each other out yeah I think. you're right yeah because not all killers are like idiots like like in the horror movies you know? yeah yeah so 
I don't know. I guess it depends of what kind of horror movie we're talking about. You know, um, a lot of them you just think like, "Fuck, just get out of the house." <laughs> like a, any ghost movie, just fucking run out. Well, they did that in Insidious. They got out of the house. Yeah, they, and... they moved out. Yeah. But well, that was clever. And I remember they're in the making of they're like, what do they always do wrong? They never move. And then they right. move the, and then yeah, it was and then that awesome reveal, like the house is on it, your son. It's awesome. Right. And I, I love that they also went from a kind of oldish looking house to a like modern house and it still didn't fix anything. It's still just as creepy, honestly. They, there's some good scares in the newer house too. So Yeah, a little boy running by is like terrifying. Oh, even just him like standing in a corner that you might see or not see, depending mm-hmm. because he doesn't do anything. God, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, fucking loved Insidious. Uh, all right, so next series of question comes for us from our co-host from the other show, Mondo, uh, who did a great job, by the way, of uh, filling in that one week. Uh, a lot of pe- positive feedback, so thank you, Mondo, for doing that. So his first question, which listener are you taking with you to investigate an extremely haunted house? Listener? Um, Cody, because he's very tall. Yeah, and he can see stuff before I can. Right there we go. Uh, it's funny. So that goes back to our Discord. We're we're at the point where we know a lot of our listeners by their names because we interact with a lot of them. So that's another reason to go on Discord. Just a great community there. Uh, I would actually pick Weezerface because I know she's like she goes to Halloween Horror Nights and does haunted houses all the time. I mean, I know it's not the same type of haunted house, but I'm taking that experience and bringing it over to a regular haunted house so i think that's what i would do uh his next question which listener is your survival companion um you know i'm gonna pull a, a shane from walking dead in that one season where he shoots the guy in the leg and lets his right. arms <laughs> kill him. <laughs> he shoots him in the leg or he hits him in the knee or something like that yeah, so you're picking mondo essentially <laughs> I'm picking, picking mondo and then i'm gonna follow that up with the other question who win did i take and also be mondo <laughs> <laughs> Because I've been with him hiking, and yeah, he doesn't like scary stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. Yeah. Uh, and I would pick, uh, oh, boy, I guess either Chuck or Cody. They both seem like guys who can take care of themselves. So I think that would be my answer there. And his last question, ca- cast your listeners as iconic horror characters. Who's who? So maybe just a couple that you can think of off the top of your head. Um, going back to Cody, he is Tyler Maines, Michael Myers, because he's huge, and that'd be a really good fit. If he hasn't been, if you haven't been Michael Myers for Halloween, you're missing out, buddy. I'm going Weezer face is Randy, a girl version of Randy, but not Randy's sister, just Randy, but right, you know what I mean? Same yeah, kind yeah. of thing. I'll stop at those two because we can go on for like hours, probably. Yeah, uh, let's see. I'm just gonna say one, I'm gonna go Teddy as Chucky. So, shout out yeah. to Teddy. Yeah, What's shout up, Teddy? To, shout out to Teddy. So that, that's what I'm picking there. <laughs> Teddy is maybe a leprechaun too. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. <laughs> or like a puppet master figure. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So, so much potential. Although he's getting really he's getting really huge right now. Like he's he's super tall for his age. Yeah. So there's a limited time here, uh, Chuck, to, to dress him up as these things. Uh, next series of questions are from Cody. Odd job versus 007. If you could own one famous horror franchise's house, which would you choose? However, the ghost or killer is still within it. That's tricky. Definitely not the Amityville house. Go ahead. I don't know. Do you have anything that pops out? Because you're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> I like the house on Haunted Hill house, like from the original. Um, you know, it's just a, it's a big house. There's nothing yeah. really particularly you know dangerous about Except it. Except for the blind maid. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But, she, but she's a maid so i mean it's, you know, there, there's a main, yeah there's a maid and a butler <laughs> so i think that you'd be well served there you got vincent price handing out drinks i mean yeah, that, yeah he's just day. saying shit to you right let's go with the the castle kind of thingy and edward scissorhands because he's a nice guy oh yeah that's and that'd one. be cool to hang out yeah he is yeah cut my hair yeah, maybe you would have a vincent price for a little while there maybe so, yeah we could both chill with our own versions of vincent price <laughs> Uh, next uh, questions are from Calum. The Fog is one of those movies that I love because it's eerie atmosphere and unique score. What are some of your favorite overlooked movies that utilize both? There's this movie called Death Watch, which is a World War I uh, ghost movie and a set with like the English and they're in like a trench, but like they go through no man's land and then they arrive on the German side, but the Germans are facing the opposite way and telling them like, 
they're, the English are telling them to surrender, but the, the Germans are like, no, like we're, they're facing down the trench away from where the British were coming from. So they're like looking for something. And uh, so you got the no man's land creepiness. You got the World War One trench warfare creepiness. And then add a ghost in there. Really good movie. So Death Watch. Nice. Uh, and I'm going to go back to what I, the movie I talked about last week, Shepard. Um, my issues with it were more story related, but the atmosphere and score were really good. Um, so that's one of the definitely high points of that movie. So that's one that immediately popped up in mind for me. Uh, his next question. A new John Carpenter movie is being made. Which characters from his films do you cast and where does it take place? I thought there really was one being made for a second there. <laughs> you got all excited? Like, what? Uh-huh. Um, you know what I was thinking, though? Like, watching The Fog, Nancy Loomis is really hot in this movie. Holy shit. Right? I actually wrote that note. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. Where she's like, there, like, I didn't care what was going on. I was just looking at her. I'm like, yeah, Damn. I don't remember thinking that in Halloween. But no, she's like half nude in Halloween. Yeah, it's weird. I don't know. There's something about the way she looks in this one, and it's a very conservative look. It's this not one's like, like what you know? three, four years after yeah. Halloween was made. Exactly. Like so it's not even that big of. A, I don't know what it is. There's it's something about hot, it, man. It, yep. It's like I think it's the business suit. Honestly, Maybe. she got the business. Like, man, she's so fucking <laughs> sexy in this movie. I mean, Jamie Lee is cute, of course, but like Nancy Loomis takes it in this movie. Yeah, I, I really thought that. Um, Tom Atkins was going for at the bar. But, uh, Tom Tom is telling everybody in this movie. <laughs> yeah, right. But he, he didn't make a move. So I was a little disappointed. Even the even the mayor. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's get uh, Charles Cyphers in there. Sheriff Brackett. Um, Nancy Loomis is dead, huh? Annie. Charles, the Sheriff Brackett's still alive. Let's get Sheriff Brackett in there. I don't care what he does. He's just a really cool, nice guy. Charles Cyphers. Yeah, it's too bad I would have picked Roddy Roddy Piper if he was still alive. But, oh, um, yeah. So, oh, uh, so, what's his name? Um, Frank I mean, Beans, what's his name? Keith I'm going to go Keith David. That's it. I was going to go Keith David and Tom Atkins in a, like, I don't know, two guys just, you know, going to pick up chicks. Pick up chicks. Like, yeah, but then something happens and they have to, like, save the town or something. That'd like, be sweet. Some, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd definitely be mine. Uh, his last question do you stay away from the fog or do you greet whatever is in the fog? I don't know, man. The fog had like glowing eyed ghost demon pirates in it. So um, stay away from it. Yeah, I agree. That seems to be the only way you're safe is to stay away from the fog. So definitely do that. And our final question this week is from Horror Fan Ryan. If it's not too late, which it's not, where does the fog rank in your list of Carpenter movies? Uh, pretty low for me. Um, we'll discuss later, but it's not in the top half or anything. Yeah, same with me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I liked it, and we'll talk about it, like, during the review, but, I mean, it's not anywhere near Halloween, Christine, uh, They Live, the, the Thing. You know, there's a lot of stuff I would put above it. Um, so, not at the bottom of his list, but maybe, like, bottom middle, <laughs> I would say, is where I'd put it in. So, yeah, we can look at his filmography later, but I, the only one I've never seen from him is The Ward. Which I, I think is Amber Heard, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yep, so I'm not going to be seeing that in either. <laughs> <Any time too. laughs> right. Um, so that's all the questions we got this week. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. We can't do this segment without you. And now, a little bit of Deadly Grounds Coffee. Everyone thinks because you're a zombie, you don't know good coffee. Well, they're wrong. There's only one brew that gets my seal of approval. Deadly Grounds Coffee is my guilty pleasure. The aroma is so intoxicating. It brings all of my neighbors out of the woodwork. Deadly Grounds Coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. It's good to get a little deadly. Use the front door! Oh, they're so disgusting. What watch? Yes. All right. Uh, my first one is 1988 Zombie 3, so a direct sequel to Zombie 2, a.k.a. Zombie 1, whatever you want to call it, from Lucio Fulci. It's fucking confusing. It's directed by uh, Lucio Fulci, Bruno Mattei, Mattei, whatever you want to say. But yeah, it's another traditional zombie movie. This time, there's like a island kind of like a retreat thing, and you got like the mil- I think it's the Philippines, actually. You got the U.S. military involved, and of course, zombies outbreaks, right? And then like some guy goes to a hotel, and it gets a hotel infected, things like that. It's nowhere near good as Zombie 2. 
Um, I'm actually just currently running through the series. So there's zombie four and then zombie five killing birds, I believe is number five after it. It's okay. Like the, the gore gags are all excellent. The zombies look really cool. It's just kind of stupid though. And like, there's this like ridiculous part where they spend like three minutes, like of screen time, just building this barricade. Right. Like it's all, <laughs> they put a bunch of wood and they fucking, yeah. And literally he says, uh, this ought to stop them for a while. And the horde of zombies come and literally just two strikes from a zombie knocks the whole thing down. And it's the funniest thing because it looks like they tried so hard to make this barricade and then the zombie comes and just destroys it in a second. The, you know, there's some effective zombie actions in it, creepy stuff like that. But overall, Unless you're like an Italian zombie guy, you can skip it. But if you want to complete the zombie series, then I guess pick it up. I think it's Severin. Uh, I probably had the company wrong, but they did a Blu-ray release of Zombie 3 and 4 that you can grab if you want to get the physical copy. Cool. My first one this week is the movie that uh, I discussed with the director, Chris Sievertson, and that's Monstrous from 2022, which is over in theaters and on demand at the moment. So in this one, a uh, mother played by Christina Ricci and her son uh, move away to a house that's kind of off the grid because of some kind of abuse by uh, her husband or the father of the kid. And this is in the 1950s. And it's basically a story of the mom trying to take care of the kid, trying to make him as happy as possible. The dad keeps calling the house and she keeps kind of refusing his calls because she's really pissed at him. And all of a sudden, the kid starts seeing like a woman ghost thing coming out of the sea that's like they're right by the sea and she's kind of starting to come out of the sea or the lake or whatever it is and starts to like haunt the place and seems to want to grab him and bring him into the sea with her and it's a lot of it is about uh, Christina Ricci's character trying to stop the thing from happening and trying to figure out what's going on and then uh, like you know on in the last act of the movie the whole thing starts getting fucked up and you start realizing that maybe the story is not what it would seem. I just don't want to say what it is because it would spoil the movie. And honestly, it's actually a pretty interesting uh, twist and turn into what the, the story is actually about. Uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's actually a good movie. It's, the story is really good. Like if I look at the story from the outside, outside perspective and think about the story, it's a really well-told story. I like the way that it's kind of slow burns into something that was kind of surprising and it's got a good, like satisfying ending. And yeah, I think the story is good. My problem with it is that it was like made in a dull way. Uh, like the character, like the creature character or the woman ghost thing could be a cool design, but the CGI is a little too much for me. It almost looks like, venom like it's all like kind of black tentacle like things all over this kind of dead woman but it's distracting i think it have just been kind of um like a sunken woman would have been creepier like like uh you know in creep show for example uh you know what that creature looked like when she uh she came out of the sea and stuff i think that would have been a better design than what the cgi mess we kind of get with this one and that's really distracting unfortunately and there's just some decisions made in the movie that I think were maybe the wrong ones, at least in my opinion, that made the film a bit duller than it should have been. But still, great story, great uh, twists and turns, and I do recommend checking it out if you get a chance. So that's uh, monstrous. Very nice. Uh, mine is a rewatch of one of my favorite movies, and it's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 1974. It's one of I, I brought like 30 movies with me on my my trip to Texas because I'm by myself and blah, blah, blah. But uh, te- uh, Texas Chainsaw was one of them because I'm like, me in Dallas, me in Texas. Let's watch TCM in Texas. Um, I mean, wh- what can I say? I mean, if you've never seen Texas Chainsaw the original, I can understand the younger crowd not seeing it, but go out and see it. You know, it's a group of kids or young adults. They're going to old family's land to look around. And then they run across, a, you know, evil family, Leatherface, the cook, hitchhiker, grandpa, and they're just cannibals and they're fucking mean. Each time I see this movie, I, I see something different or maybe not different, just I appreciate something differently. For example, when uh, Sally thinks she's safe and she runs into the cook's arms at the barbecue gas station, uh, you know, he ends up capturing her and he puts in her sack and in his truck, he starts hitting her with a broken um, handle of wood handle or something. And it's like really mean spirited. It's like one of the most 
uh, dirty scenes, in my opinion. Like, and it's saying a lot too, because I mean, you have Leatherface um, beating the first guy to death, and he's having a seizure, and he he kills him. You have him hanging him, hanging the girl on that meat hook, and so on. And there's just something about the performance of the cook. He's like, he feels bad about killing, but he just can't help himself, and he, he has a he he feels bad about finding pleasure in torturing her and he's just hitting her like over and over again and laughing and stuff and it's like really effective um and then of course we get to the dinner scene infamous dinner scene where man that movie does not stop for like 25 minutes straight it's just like pure grossness grotesque uh sweaty slimy smelly you can smell the screen everything is like extremely effective and it's one of the best horror movies ever made period for how effective it is even all these years later so it never fails to give me the sense that I'm watching something that's real during that dinner scene because it's just it's just nuts so TCM original far superior than the remake um yeah that's that yeah definitely a classic I watched it pretty recently too and loved it the the only thing that I'm annoyed with is Franklin like he's such an annoying character you know Um, what I I kind of picked up something too uh, on Franklin again I, I feel the same way but he's clearly got like a mental handicap. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But it was weird because I don't know if you noticed, but the hitchhiker does like the whole blowing a raspberry thing with your tongue, like yeah, right. to them. And then I'm like, oh, that's where fucking Franklin gets it from <laughs> when he's pissed right. off at his family for having fun. So I'm like, oh, that's weird. Like he, even though he had this like weird encounter with his man that freaking cut him, put his own blood all over his car and everything. He's still mimicking his bad behavior towards it like towards his own family i'm like he fucking weirdo frankly and then he comes back in part two yeah right as a corpse but <laughs> right. yeah no it's uh it's a great movie though uh so my second one this week is uh the remake of the movie that we're reviewing today so that's 2005's the fog so this one stars uh maggie grace and uh, tom welling which is superman and maggie grace i know from lost primarily so it's basically the same story as the fog uh it's almost beat for beat it's not like quite shot for shot but it's very beat for beat uh from the fog which is basically the story of there's people who did bad things in the past and uh these kind of pirate you know ship people are mad at it and they come back and claim uh, other people's lives in revenge for what happened to them and uh, in the future, there's a girl who's a radio host uh, in, a, in a lighthouse, and she's kind of warning people that the fog is coming. And meanwhile, this couple is trying to figure out what's going on, saving the girl's kid. And basically the same story as the other fog. So I hadn't seen the fog, like either versions. I'd never seen this version, but I had seen the other one a long time ago. So I kind of try to want, go into this not thinking of it as a remake, but just as its own film. And honestly, it's not... Like, a lot of people say it's a bad film. I don't think so. I think it's actually a decent uh, remake. Now, if you compare it to the original, sure, the, the original's better. And that's just the way it is. But there are things about the remake that I kind of liked. I thought the story was a little clearer in the remake than the original. Like, the reason for why uh, the, you know, pirates are kind of coming back to kill people makes more sense to me in the remake than it does in the original. I think the creatures are pretty cool looking. It's just unfortunately that they they seem to be like re, like practical creatures, but they add CGI, I guess, to make them look more like ghosty than they would. And that hurts it a little bit, in my opinion. I mean, Tom Welling and uh, Maggie Grace do a good job of their characters. Now, they're not Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis, but I mean, you're just not going to be them, you know? So I still think they do a pretty good job of it. They're good actors. I do find the second, like the secondhand cast, the rest of the cast is not that great, particularly one of the survivors from the boat incident uh, that you see also in the original. But overall, I think it's a decent watch. It's not like the worst film ever. You know, it's of course, watch the original before this one. But if you like that story, I think it's a decent watch. So that's The Fog which I watched over on a Canadian network, CTV. Are you doing the Toxic Avengers anytime soon? Yeah, I think I'm going to do it soon, but not that soon. Uh, too. I know you watched it, so you can talk about yeah. it. All right, so Toxic Avenger 1984. Um, traditional trauma movie. I'm not the biggest trauma fan. I think their movies are just... Like, Full Moon is, is like, cheesy, but their early stuff was good. This Most of the trauma is just cheesy slash bad. Um, but the Toxic Avenger is pretty cool. 
Um, but basically, this little nerdy dude uh, named Melvin, he gets thrown in a toxic vat in uh, Tromaville because it's the world capital of like um, toxic waste or something stupid. And he gets terrorized by the, he works at a gym and these gym rats terrorize him until he falls out of a window into the, the, the waste and then he turns into a, a buff uh, mutant that fights crime and he has to, like he senses crime and it like makes him fight bad people like he can't control it um so yeah he just goes around cleaning up town he goes he cleans up gangbangers um but then of course like the mayor doesn't like him because he's a vigilante and then they send him the army and blah 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 uh the gore gags are like all excellent it's you know practical stuff especially in the 80s it's going to be awesome there's a bunch of head squishes there's arms getting pulled off stuff like that it's really good i just don't like the comedy because the comedy is stupid it's more more in the sequel which i'll talk about next week but the comedy is just like i don't get it comedy like it's like low-hanging fruit kind of stuff where you're like this is not funny but there's some scenes that are actually like generally genuinely like creepy and bad like there's one where um these gangbangers invade like a taco place and the lead actor in that scene he's like half i think white and red face paint or something like that maybe black and red something like that but he's really good and like there's this child that's in the scene maybe like four years old and he points the shotgun at him starts uh, screaming at him and the kid starts crying and you can like damn this is for real like he's terrified i'm like this mom sucks for putting him in this movie because it's trauma it's not like something universal or something but that scene is really good so there's a couple good bit characters there's a gang guy, or the gym rat named bozo he's so over the top and his little crew like their whole thing is going around town in their car just running people down they have a point system kids are certain point adults people on bikes things like that and they just go kill people but bozo it's like extremely overacted but in an excellent way because he's just like a cartoon character you know it's it's not like the greatest thing i've ever seen i gave it three and a half out of five on letterbox so definitely a positive film um for the gore i just honestly didn't like some of the kid stuff like the the directions they went with killing this one kid it was kind of like okay this is kind of over the top but uh toxic manager 1984 i'm gonna run through part three and four next and then eventually the remake whenever they get that out i haven't watched them in like 25 years uh isn't this isn't the first one that's he's like after a blind girl and he like uh jump ropes with someone's intestine and stuff like that or is that one of the sequels uh well his blind, the blind girl's his girlfriend okay so and this one all of them um i don't remember the jump rope scene but yeah he rescues her she, she's about to get raped in the taco place and then she comes in and she's smoking hot of course and that's like the joke is that she's super hot but she's like very clumsy and stuff like that but I've, I've never seen past the first one until now okay i was just gonna say a spoiler i won't spoil it but, uh it's probably oh. number two i'm thinking about then so yeah they go to japan in number two and it's terrible <laughs> <laughs> uh all right so my last one this week is a movie i watched over on tubi and it's from 2013 and it's also directed by uh, the one the interview that i have today chris sievertson and that's all cheerleaders die so in this movie um a bunch of cheerleaders are kind of like doing a cheer squad and are talking about how it's the most dangerous uh, sport in like America and how many there's more injuries per like athlete than any other sport. And then sure enough, uh, the lead cheerleader does one of those like high jumps where people kind of throw her up and they miss her and she lands on her head and like essentially the head dies, you know, in a very violent way. So the movie picks up three months later and they're looking for a new head cheerleader and they bring one in and it's kind of causing jealousy between both the cheerleaders and the football team uh, because she's hot and everything. And it's kind of causing friction between pre-established relationships. Um, so she, they, they're about to go to some party and this girl, she uh, finds out that her boyfriend, who's one of the people on the football team, cheated on her. So she dumps him, but then she starts dating the girl that is new to the cheerleader team. And that creates another thing of friction with one of their sisters who has these magical runes and you can make a spell with those magical runes. So she makes a spell by accident, I think. I'm not, it's not super clear that gets all the cheerleaders killed in an accident because she's like mad at them and she accidentally does a spell that gets them all killed. So they die in some, in a car crash all together in the same car. And then she makes another spell that brings them back to life. But now they're like, flesh hungry almost kind of like vampires uh but without the sun and all that stuff like they don't have all the vampire tropes just basically that they're hungry almost like zombies slash vampires and the movie is about how uh the girls are trying to survive and the football team starting to get 
you know, uh, wise to it because it's kind of their fault that they died. And it's a really crazy fucking story. Hell of a roller coaster film, not in a tra- traditional sense where the story is like, you know, goes through peaks and valleys. It's that I was kind of thinking, okay, this movie's really good. Like, there's a lot of great gore and a lot of great scenes. And then it goes into these really stupid, like, magic segments. I'm like, okay, maybe this movie's not that good. But then something else happens. I'm like, okay, maybe this movie's pretty good. Then something else happens. I'm like, okay, no, this movie sucks. It's a, this is a terrible. And it just goes like that the whole fucking movie. This is like half a good movie and half a bad movie combined. It's like there are two writers and they clashed as what this movie should be. Uh, the horror part of it, really good. Like, I really, really enjoy that stuff. The magic rune CGI part of it, absolute dog shit. I wish they didn't do that. Uh, so yeah, it's still an enjoyable movie overall. And like I said on my letterbox review, it's like good enough that I'm really happy I watched it, but bad enough that's going to prevent me from ever watching it again. So go at it, you know, try to have fun with it because there are some really killer scenes in it, but expect some pretty dumb shit as well. So that's all cheerleaders die over on Tubi. What was the year for that one? 2013. 2013? Oh, very new. Mm-hmm. Newish. All right. So not official trivia, but a trivia game nonetheless. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna put you, I'm gonna put you on the spot this time, Mr. Fucking Perfect Score. All right, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. Three, two, one, go. 1980s? Incorrect. 90s? No. 2000s? No. 2010s? No. 70s? Yes. Ooh. Uh, is it zombies? No. Ghosts? No. Text Chainsaw? No. <laughs> <laughs> I had to try. <laughs> uh, is there a slasher? No. Camp? No. Ooh, a lot of nudity? Not a lot. But is there's for- nudity. Foreign? No. Jesus. Um, no, so not Jesus. Can't be. No. <laughs> can't be Halloween. Nope. Uh, shit. Does it star a, a big name? Not at all. Is it like grizzly or something? <laughs> no. <laughs> so does it have animals? No. Oh, fuck. Uh, is there like exorcism? Nope. Jesus. No ghosts? No ghosts. Fuck. Is there, is it's it a horror movie? <laughs> it's, a, it's a horror film. Two seconds left. Uh, and, all right, final guess. No animals, no ghosts, no zombies, no <laughs> slashers. Kind of takes away all the... No, nothing, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, I don't even know. Uh, now it's going to pass. I have no idea. Last house on the left. Oh, interesting. Home invasion. Yeah, yeah. home invasion. Yeah, dude. Not a big home invasion guy, so it's like... No, it's that, a fuck that movie, though. Doesn't even go on my radar. Really? Um, not, not a fan of it? No, I, I like it. I just don't like home invasion movies in general. Uh, yeah, that right. one's probably like one of the better ones. Mm-hmm. But no, it's uh all right, when you're ready. Sixties. No. Seventies. No. Eighties. No. Nineties. No. Two thousand. Yes. Okay. Uh ghost. No. Uh zombies. No. Zom uh demons. No. Possession. No. Um animals. No. Um <laughs> Thousands, uh, uh, slasher. Kind of. Kind of slasher. Um, is it a big? Is it a Jason movie? Well, that's kind of a slasher. It's no, a slasher. It's, it's not Friday. Um, is it a uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movie? No. Is it have a big name horror actor in it? Yeah, I would say so. And it's in the two thousands. Is it Kevin Bacon's Stir of Echoes? No. It's, yeah, it's not super slasher. It's just. <laughs> Super, uh, kind of. I don't know. Uh, man, these are fucking hard. All right, well, final guess. Two thousands, not a ghost. Um, I have no clue. No, you give up? Uh, yeah. Saw. Oh boy. It's, he kind of he's kind of a slasher, but not really. Yeah. You know? He doesn't tortured. really do it. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't really do it himself. I would have said torture. I would have got it for sure. Mm-hmm. All right. Oh, gotta pull my <laughs> and go. Uh, 80s, correct. Okay, slasher, no, uh, ghost, no, zombies, no, foreign, kind of, kind of, <laughs> yeah, you'll right. see why. I'm Z- zombie, time. no, uh, let's see, is it a f- is it a giallo, no, or Fulci, 
No. Um, kind of. Animals? Yes. Oh, uh, it's a grizzly? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it um, a bear? Crocodile? No. no. Is it a, a, a land mammal? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Land uh, mammal. Oh, well, it could have been like a crocodile or yeah. hip, hippo or some shit. Uh, is it uh, something that's in the U.S.? Could be. Could be. Uh, outside of a zoo? <laughs> what? Pause. Like, what? like, is it native to the U.S.? No, it's a horror movie, so it's like... No, the, the animal. I mean... No. Resume. Oh, yeah. Um... Five seconds. Oh, Jesus. Ooh, you're almost there. I can feel it. All right. Final guess. Uh, not native to the U.S. Probably something in the zoo. I don't think it's a lion or tiger. No, no, no. it could be native to the U.S. It's, oh, it could be okay. It could. It's anywhere. Uh, alligator. No, American Werewolf in London. Oh fuck! Because <laughs> it could. It's kind of foreign because it's set in yeah. the United Kingdom, even though it's John Landis' it's an American movie, and then it's a wolf. So right. I thought, I thought you were gonna go there with the wolf. No, I wasn't thinking like werewolf. I was thinking more actual animal. Yeah. All right, all right. Let's pull up mine here. All right, so you ready? Yes. And go. Slasher. No. Ghost. Yes. Uh, demon. Kind of. Kind of. Uh, two thousands. Yes. Um, haunted house. No. Not no, not a haunted house. Uh, haunted haunted camera. Haunted camera. Yeah, sure. No. <laughs> yeah. Is it um, a girl that comes out of a well? Nope. Um, it's pretty specific. <laughs> is it Kevin Bacon, Stir of Echoes? No. Damn it. Uh, is it set outside? Mostly. Is it Evil Dead remake? No. Uh, damn it. Mostly set outside. Uh, yeah. Um, mostly set outside. Demonic kind of possession kind of. Um, is it? Uh, I, I didn't say possession. I don't know what you got. Ghost, oh. ghost, kind of. Ghost and demonic. Yeah. Is it the uh, the forest with your girlfriend Maggie from Walking Dead? Wrong. Final guess. <sighs> the descent. Wrong. Ah, damn it. It's the fog. The fog. This stupid movie. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Man, we are not good today. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Reset. And ready? Yep. Go. 90s? Correct. Uh, slasher? No. Ghost? No. Detective story? Like it's got a detective in it. It's got a detective in it, but it's not a detective story. Okay. Uh, does it have Hannibal Lecter in it? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, got a detective in it? It's not, it's not a focus, though. It has one in there, but okay. it's not the focus. Uh, it's not a slasher? No. Zombie? No. Uh, ghosts? No. Animal? Yes. The creature feature? Okay. Uh, let's see. What's in it? And you said 90s, right? Yeah. Ooh, is it a sequel? No. A remake? No. Is it foreign? No. Is the animal uh, American, like native? Yeah. Uh, is it a it's bear? It's foreign to you since it's in America. Yeah, but... yeah but I mean to you. I said native US. Is it a bear? No. Crocodile or alligator? Yes. Oh, yes. Is it crocodile too? Or no? no. Is it final guess. Crocodile? No. Final guess. Uh, Lake Placid. Yep. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oof. Is that a end. crocodile or alligator? I don't remember. It's a crocodile. Crocodile. Yeah, because they wanted something that wasn't native to the U.S. For oh, it wasn't native to the oh, whatever for, for same, maximum. Same yeah, thing. It's, it's fine. <laughs> All right, let me just same pull up my last one here. I got one more. Cool. Yeah, you got one more. All right, come on. Get on the board, baby. All right, go. 2000s. No. 2010s. No. Uh, this decade. No. 90s. Yes. Uh, is it an animal? No. Is it a zombie? No. Is uh, it a, not really, no. Is it a ghost? No. Is it a slasher? Yes. Is it um Uncle Sam movie? No. Damn. <laughs> is it... So it's a slasher, you said? Yeah, yeah, it's a slasher. Consider a slasher. Um, does that have Freddy Krueger in it? No. Jason Voorhees? No. Michael Myers? No. Uh, Scream? No. Um, man, I'm fucking terrible. It's a slasher, kind of. 
Um, is it fucking Maniac Cop? No. Maniac Cop 2? No. <laughs> uh, Psycho Cop 1 or 2? No. No? I'm really stuck on the cop thing. Is, no it, cop. Stir- no Kevin- cop. is it Kevin Bacon's Stir of Echoes? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say it till I get it. Final guess. I don't know. Tell me. Leprechaun. Leprechaun. Hey, he's a slasher. I did say slasher. I said... Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I, you yeah. said kind of. Yeah. I but, yeah. Yeah, yeah he kills people. It, it's more the, the zombie ghost, like, what is he really? You know, it's a... It's Mythological... Not, yeah. Creature. I don't even know what you call him. Right. Fairy tale something. Mm-hmm. All right. I wonder how right. Joe would do on those. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to bring it back uh, at least one more time just for... I might just do like one question, yeah, uh, and just add the other types of questions. You know, like I might do like one of each now, one of this, one of the four like clues, yeah. and then a regular trivia question. That works. There's one I've been holding on to for like fucking a month now. Because <laughs> when, when I hear echoes. yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> when, when I hear interesting trivia somewhere, I like write it down and then like something that's I find interesting that I didn't know yeah. or so. Huh. But then I hold on to it for fucking months. <laughs> And everyone's absent all the time. All right. All right. The Fog. Yes. John Carpenter, 1980, 89 minutes. Lock your doors, bolt your windows, there's something in the fog. Strange things begin to occur as a tiny California coastal town prepares to com- commemorate its centenary, centennial, whatever that word is, 100 years. Inanimate objects bring eerily to life. Reverend Malone stumbles upon a dark secret about the town's founding. Radio announcer Stevie witnesses a mystic- mystical fire, and a hitchhiker Elizabeth discovers a wiener, um, the mutilated corpse of a fisherman. That wasn't true, by the way, than wiener. Then a mysterious iridescent fog descends upon the village, and more people start to die. Um, yeah, so we got Adrian Barbeau, escape from New York, um, fame. She's like this radio DJ of a terrible radio station. I hated it. I was like, I, I know in the making of, I think he wanted to do like traditional rock music, but like they couldn't get rights or something. So right. they did this stupid ass jazz, which my God, like who's, who's staying up at three in the morning, listen to this shit, like crazy ass people. <laughs> the people for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and then we got this reverend, right? He conveniently part of the wall crumbles and this uh, old reverend from 100 years ago his grandfather i believe his like diary pops out and it comes to light that 100 years ago this leper colony tried to come on to where this town is located now and the townspeople didn't want a leper colony near them so they misguided them into rocks and they broke apart on the shore and then those people went salvaged the gold which in turn founded the town and now it's said 100 years later and weird wonky shit starts happening uh, stuff starts turning on. Glass starts breaking randomly. There's a bunch of fog coming in. Meanwhile, I got Tommy Atkins, who's like a local. Uh, he's driving around. He picks up Jamie Lee Curtis, who's hitchhiking. And then in one of the funniest transitions of all time, like the scene we see Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis, they're chilling in the car. And then like 10 minutes later, their next scene, they're in bed. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> I was like, damn, Tommy. <laughs> uh, it was so it was just so funny to me. I don't know why. She, they're just they already banged. I'm like, damn um yeah and then you know fishermen go missing they find them but their like bodies are missing things like that so like the townspeople trying to figure out what's going on meanwhile they're planning the 100 year celebration of the town's founding um and then people are talking about like the core group are talking about how they fucked over these people the lepers 100 years ago stevie's got a kid that's watched by everyone but her in this movie <laughs> and that's a big plot point later on when he's uh trapped along with the babysitter and she's in her little radio tower screaming for someone to go help her everyone but her go help him and uh yeah leave it at that um this is probably second third time and i not a huge fan of this one um, which i'll discuss later but i do like the score it's classic john carpenter i love tom atkins jamie lee curtis is awesome uh the halloween reunion you got nancy loomis who's a fucking babe in this movie um what's her name from um psychos in this Anna right Lee. yeah mm-hmm. and then um charles cyphers he plays like the meteorologist that's flirting with stevie from halloween sheriff bracket so i really like seeing all those old faces because this is like a couple years after halloween so halloween wasn't like the hit it was now so jamie lee curtis is still kind of like not a big name um so it was cool to see them like i said i like the score and i really like the look of the lepers slash pirates slash um zombie slash ghosts um their glowing eyes is awesome the fog itself is a really cool character just by itself and of course the setting is beautiful it's got the the ocean water, the small town feel. Um, so that's what I liked about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I've only seen this once before. 
and it's been probably in their like early 2000s or maybe like like two, yeah 2005 to 2010 and around that area so it's been a while since i've seen it and i, I enjoy it you know uh, i don't think it's one of the best uh, john carpenter movies like i've said before uh but there are some really good things about it um i i really love the line are you weird <laughs> it just just such a funny line like there's no good answer to that question really you know he he had the good answer he nailed her like 10 minutes later oh yeah the, the Tom Atkins, of like, course. yeah <laughs> <weird>. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah he was great that that whole scene was really really good uh i really know like how he hit the hitchhiker jackpot like anytime i see a hitchhiker they don't look like jamie lee curtis you know that's usually uh yeah they're either they're talking either. themselves or yeah, it's a, like a hobo looking person. flipping you off and stuff. <laughs> exactly yeah um so definitely hit the jackpot on that one I, I i i know it's not related to this movie but god i wish this was like halloween 4 they should have just taken tom atkins character and brought in jamie lee curtis and done halloween 4 that way instead of this because those two are so great together i really enjoy their rapport i love how she just like hangs around with them for the rest of the movie you know even though she's on her way to canada it's kind she's of annoyed like, too yeah right <laughs> yeah he's like damn yeah because he saw nancy loomis and he's like damn yeah <laughs> there's more someone else in the town that i can go after but uh yeah the movie itself th- there's a lot of good stuff i like you said the score so good john carpenter's score it's always so iconic and so like it feels 70s 80s you know i just love his scores and it's no different with this one um there's some pretty brutal kills in this one the i stab kill is really freaking brutal and def- i i hate eyes and nails are two things i have a really hard time with in uh horror movies so when someone gets stabbed in the eye or someone's like scraping their nails and they the nails like come off i can't do it like it, there's two things so that kill in particular really affected me so what, what do you know what a stomach uh pounder is they, they mentioned this in the movie yeah the little kid wants one right right yeah i'm, I'm assuming it's like a burger maybe yeah, I, I don't but know. <laughs> I don't really know. It was a weird term for it. But I even looked it up after, and I don't remember. So yeah, it probably just know. porn came up. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, that was something that I found interesting. I really like the lighthouse station like set. I think it's such a cool, almost like a character in this movie, the lighthouse. And I really like the way it is. I I love that she has to go down like a thousand fucking stairs to get to her uh, workplace that was a note too i'm like it sucks if you forget your that right in your car. <laughs> yeah god there's so many steps to get to that lighthouse it's just like absolutely insane no wonder she didn't want to go after her own kid she's like i don't know she's getting like, my mm. kid walk in like a hundred steps to get, get to the car to get the kid now nah, i'll just yeah. i'll just scream on the radio <laughs> right exactly uh i also love and i've noticed this recently uh, even though i've always loved it it's only like been a revelation to me recently I love investigative horror. I love when the story revolves around people trying to investigate a mystery. Uh, like any movie that does that, you know, we're talking about Seven, Silence of the Lambs, uh, The Conjuring in some ways, you know, the Warrens are kind of investigating those. I fucking love these movies. And this one does some investigation. And I thought that was really cool. Uh, so I enjoy that about it. Um, I-, I love how perverted the weatherman is. You know, uh, the Cyphers is a, He's like so horny the whole movie. I, th- I thought that was freaking hilarious. Everyone's horny for her voice. Right. No, exactly. The, yeah. Everyone in the sailors. The, the sailors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just, th- there's a lot of good stuff about it, you know? Um, I think where the movie falters a little bit, I didn't like the faceless creatures as much. Uh, I know you said you liked the design. I, I feel like they didn't feel threatening to me for some reason. I didn't feel that they were that dangerous. Um, maybe it's because they don't kill enough during the movie. You know, their goal is only to kill, I think, six people. It says you only need to kill six. Um, I don't know. There's something about them that wasn't resonating with me. And it's also like the final scene with kind of the zombie attack at the church. It wasn't really doing it for me. You know, he just kind of hands the cross back. And we think at least that's that's the end of it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I thought there could down. have been something better. It was very anticlimactic yeah like i know like the ending ending is cool but like the the real ending where he gives away the crosses like eh. but I, I do really like the shot of them coming into the church and they're walking slowly yeah. down the pews that's really cool mm-hmm. but um to go back to the sailors what are those guys doing they're just on a boat at two in the morning drinking beer uh, i assume like, they're laying fishing. on the bed together uh, yeah i, I assume they're, they're just fishermen the right they're out there 
Well, they need to get up and start fishing. <laughs> yeah, but not at like two in the morning or midnight or whatever that time it is. At, I at guess. The time. So Listen I think smooth jazz with your with yeah. your buddies. <laughs> I don't think it's a jazz that they're listening to. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, it, to me, that's normal. I mean, you know, in Jaws, they kind of do that too, right? They don't fish all yeah, night. Yeah, that's you true. Know? You're right. So they just get, cool. get drunk and listen to stories. Uh, you want to talk I, about skies. Right. I, I love the shot of the ship uh, that the mm. those sailors see. Like, it's just such a cool on the shot. Mm. Fog just always looks cool in movies, mm. you know, if they do it properly. Uh, I thought that's why the, the mist was so effective. Uh, like, the, the movie The Mist. I, I just like the look of fog and smoke and stuff like that. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. I, like, I like Tommy Atkins, but let's not drink and drive, bud yeah no kidding let's put the beers away it's two in the morning it's foggy and you're drinking beer come on and then um i also said fuck the shopkeeper who grabs an orange juice off the shelf drinks it and puts it back (laughs) yeah oh my god dude you're fucking gross buddy right i think that's in um what is which one is it friday 13th three maybe where the yeah it's three or four i don't know but there's a shopkeeper and he's like eating donuts he's he has like powdered donuts and he opens the orange juice and eat drinks and puts it back like, you got your floaties in there like i hate when people do that shit yeah so absolutely. like yeah uh, another uh, weird, weird note i had was so when uh tom atkins and jamie lee curtis are in the car at the beginning when he picks her up uh the windows shatter and they're kind of mm-hmm. like oh shit are you okay are you okay they don't pick up the glass shards that are all over inside <laughs> inside of the car. They just drive off. So they just drive off with the fucking glass shards all over them on the floor, like on their like just eh, okay. Let's that just w- keep going. Let's go fuck. <laughs> that would have been a cool transition. The banging though, he's like, here, let me get the glass out of your off your pants, and then <laughs> right, oops, and then they look at eye contact, and then that's what we bang. They should add to that, John. Come on. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know. Not a ton to talk about in this movie. I mean, I don't know if you have other notes, but no, I I just overall kind of find it find it a little bit dull. You know, at the end of the day, it's like I do like the build up, but then like the way it ends. I know you get the the pirate showing up at the end and killing the guy anyway. But yeah, um, that, that was kind of weird though. It's I don't know. It's just felt, yeah, they left and then came back. I guess yeah, like why? <laughs> like I don't know. It, it just felt like a lazy way to end the movie. Um, yeah. Like the whole thing, the the entire ending was to me a lazy way to end the movie i thought they mm-hmm. could have done something better you know some kind of battle that's not yeah, there's just... really there's really no stakes at the end there no they're just like they always they stand by that window and they all get pulled through the or half get pulled through the window but somehow escape it that's really yeah. all the fighting they do you know just pulling away from the window which is such a weird thing and you have a great location you have all these like iconic you know actors and actresses and characters and that's what you give us to just hand yeah. the cross back like it doesn't make sense yeah sorry here's your cross yeah exactly it's uh yeah but I, 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 oh yeah i was Go gonna ahead. say the i think the priest could have been a better character too like i didn't really get his deal so much uh i thought he could have been a more important character it's kind of the same in the remake too uh he's there but that doesn't really affect the movie all that much he's there uh, just to like give us backstory yeah, kind of. He's like an exp- exposition dump character. Yeah. Uh, same thing with Janet Lee. I, you know, I, I love Janet Lee from Psycho, but I didn't think she added really all that much to the story. Like that could have just been Nancy Loomis, basically playing both those characters in one. You know, she oh, really yeah. wasn't required there. So. Yeah, more Nancy Loomis for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to go back to the question, it's like uh, probably bottom half of the carpenter filmography for sure it's not terrible by any means but it's definitely not near his top because he's got so many like great movies that it's hard to put this one and i know a lot of people find this movie like amazing that's cool it just didn't really do it for me yeah be, being on the bottom of the carpenter list is not an insult you know yeah. because there's such a great fucking pool to, to pick from yeah it's um, down there with like prince of darkness and escape from la and um, I, I have a soft spot for Escape from LA though because God, it's so I, I had it on VHS when I was a kid, so I watched it a lot. I didn't have that many VHSs, so it's yeah. just like one of Bruce those. Bruce Campbell, things. yeah. <laughs> I like when a snake. He's like, they got the drop on him, and he plays a game where he throws a can in the air. Oh yeah, and he shoots them both. <laughs> right. <laughs> like I like how like a big part of the story is him playing basketball and making like <laughs> shots. Like doesn't what? he surf too? Yeah, he does. He, oh, like he, a tidal he, wave. He or surfs something? on a tidal wave at the end <laughs> in the worst CGI ever. It's I gotta super watch that fucking again. goofy. Yeah. 
Oh yeah. boy, yeah. The first one doesn't the first one uh, Escape from New York have uh, Donald Pleasance? Isn't he the president? I want to yeah. say he is. I think I think so. Which makes sense because Carpenter reuses his people a yeah. lot. Yeah. So that'd be I, fun to go through his Carpenter's movies and see who's reused over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and something that I think funny. Spoiler alert for uh, Escape from L.A. is that <laughs> the whole the whole story is about this gang that could essentially take away like electricity so that <laughs> like there would be no power for people to use their like TVs and their radios and shit like that. And then Snake Plissken saves the day, but then shuts off the electricity anyway. <laughs> <laughs> because he doesn't give a shit <laughs> i love it it's so fucking Dude, we gotta do a double feature of both those yeah they're probably on the podcast yeah 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 yeah, for sure mm-hmm. but uh yeah like i love christine halloween obviously a thing yeah. i even like ghost of mars over this one like ghost of mars got like a stupid charm to it yeah, ice cube. it's ice cube right yeah it's ice cube let's go see is uh which films he directed 32 films so let's see yeah the ward i haven't seen so i don't know yeah, me either uh, i like vampires more than this yeah uh, village of the dam i put under this uh, i don't you know what? i don't think i've seen village of the damned i don't know that's uh it's, it's decent but it's not you know as good i'd put memoirs of invisible man under this body bags i probably put under this so yeah they're i mean it's Starman. cigarette burns is good that's a tv show though yeah, so no, I guess maybe it would be mid, midway through. I, I like it better than Assault on Precinct Thirteen. Really? Yeah, I like that one. I, uh, Mouth of Madness isn't that good in my opinion. I never really got into Big Trouble in Little China, which I need I, to rewatch. I, like I watched it. that one as a kid. Yeah, I, I liked it. It's it's goofy, but so yeah, so maybe mid midway through his, uh, his yeah. filmography, I'd put this one. For sure. Yeah, but if you remove Halloween, I think my top three would be. The Thing, Christine, and They Live. Which yeah. is, I mean, probably everyone's top three. Yeah, me too. It would be those <laughs> those three, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, so read it. Uh, I'm going a six out of ten. And maybe a little go... lower, maybe a little higher. Nah, probably not higher. Maybe a little <laughs> lower. Uh, I'm a little higher than that. I actually give it a seven out of ten. Uh, I still really enjoyed watching it. Love the score. Love the actors in it. You know, I can watch Tom Atkins, Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, Nancy Loomis, apparently, uh, all day long. So she awakened something even, in me. Even Adrian Barbeau, like you know, her her character uh, definitely way better than Selma Blair in the remake. So, uh, like her character. I, I mean, uh, yeah, the jazz music is what it is. But I love that set, and I love what was going on in there. So yeah, I'm thinking about the cast. I think of. of met three people from this movie nancy loomis um charles cyphers and tom adkins yeah all yeah. cool people i don't think i've met any of them no i haven't met any of them but i have nancy loomis and jamie lee curtis's autograph that's awesome and adrian barbo so i have those three oh i met her too I, I yeah, that's that. right i did meet adrian barbo so there's there's one that mm-hmm. i met through this movie was was she married to carpenter yes yeah, we uh, we talked a, about that. Huh? We talked about one time, not yeah, when we did the last time we talked about Carpenter. Yeah, I had a huge crush on her from Escape from New York for obvious reasons, mm-hmm. two big obvious reasons. Right. <laughs> yeah, she's uh, no, she's good, and she was really cool in person too. Mm-hmm. So. She's tiny. Yeah, for me it was Creep Show that I uh, that's oh I yeah seen her from more. She uh, she plays the one with the monster in the crate. That's uh, Tom Savini's, isn't it? Talk no, he did the fuck. He did the monster for. He did the monster. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Cool. And I All think right. we just picked this one because like three people said something about it. On <laughs> so, yeah. We're like, fuck it. <laughs> so, so what happened is that uh, I found like a random thing on Twitter that uh, was basically like pick three out of a list of Carpenter movies, like your top three, and more people than I expected picked The Fog in their top three. And then we need to uh, review something this week, and Todd's like, "Hey, why don't we just do The Fog?" It's like, sure, why not? You know. I love to do a classic. I haven't seen it in a long time. It's Carpenter. I never go wrong with Carpenter. So definitely happy about it. Um, as for next week, I think, and Todd, if you're able to, uh, we're thinking of doing The Sadness, which is a new movie Sadness. coming out on Shudder. It's a oh. Japanese film, and apparently it's like psychotically gory and crazy. Ooh. A lot is it of out now or is it coming out? It's coming out Thursday. Sweet. Um, so I think that's what we're going to do. I think yeah. it'd be a good, uh, you know, we haven't just, done a just remind film me. in a while. Yeah, I will. I haven't done a foreign film in a while. Oh, yeah. I think uh, I'm, I'm 
I'm going by reputation. I, who knows? Shudder sometimes overhypes their stuff, but I think Joe said he knew people who saw it and they said it was really messed up. This is a uh, Korean or Japanese, you said? I think it's Japanese. Cool. I'll double check before it's I... It's funny, whenever we do a foreign film, we usually end up on their iTunes charts, so that'd be yeah, awesome to get some Japanese that's, listeners. That's, uh, that's true. So let me check here. Uh, the Sadness. I don't want to cool. read the... Oh, is it Japanese? No, it's Taiwan. Oh, isn't that the same as... Uh, didn't we do a Taiwanese film last year that ended uh, up on your list? Yeah. Um, was it the girl... The or- where they go to the orphanage thing? Yeah, I forgot. The Queen of Black Magic was there a you go. Taiwan yeah. film. And so okay, we also... Some good movies. Isn't it Taiwan that we did a whole episode about uh, one time where we did... Oh. Uh, I forgot what the movie we did though. Oh, um... There's like a... It's a three... There's three movies in the series. I have it in my... What the fuck was it? I'll find and we it. did it because we were on their charts. That's why we that's did a, a that's a, It's the first time we charted on another country yeah. that wasn't like one of the mainline countries. So we like did a whole episode about it. It was the tag along. The tag along. That's right. There's three of them on Tubi, aren't there? Yep, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I've only seen the first two. The third one wasn't on Tubi at the time, mm. uh, but it is now. It's on my list of things to watch. So we're coming for you, Taiwan. Checks right, out. for you. The sadness over on Shutter as of uh, well, the day that this release is, it already be out. So. Sweet, cool. Yep. All right. So thank you everyone for listening to our, the episode. Uh, don't forget to rate us on iTunes. It helps mm-hmm. us out a lot, and we highly appreciate it. And check us out on all the social medias. It's the Horror Squad podcast on you know Twitter, Instagram. Uh, like I said, join our Discord, Facebook, all that stuff. So. And the interview after this, after we yeah. sign off, got your yeah. interview. Yeah, with uh, Chris Sievertson, director of Monstrous. And uh, all you guys on Discord, let's do some uh, casual shaming of Joe for not being on the last two episodes. Yeah, seriously, like what the hell? Turd. <laughs> 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 all right, thanks for right. listening, everybody. Bye. Bye. Welcome back, everyone, to the Horror Squad podcast, where tonight we have a very special guest. Genre fans would know him best for his films, All Chillers Die and I Know Who Killed Me. He's here to promote his new film, Monstrous, which releases May 13th in theaters and on demand, Chris Sievertson. Chris, how are you doing? I'm great. How about you? I'm doing great. Thanks. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Monstrous? Yeah, Monstrous is, uh, you know, a a really cool screenplay that that came to me that I instantly clicked with. Um, It's a 1950s psychological horror movie kind of mashed up with a creature feature um it's kind of like a various different ways you could describe it but that's kind of how what i always come back to um and very much uh, a character study so we had um you know christina ricci plays the lead uh and she you know definitely is someone that can hold her own in in a, a character study so so i was really happy to um get the chance to work with her Awesome. Uh, yeah, she's absolutely great in this film. And uh, so is the rest of the cast. Can you tell us a little bit of what it was like working with her and the rest of the cast on this project? Yeah, it was it was really a dream working with her. You know, she's just uh, just like I consider her an iconic actor and like a real movie star. Um, you know, she's been acting every day since she was 10, you know, starting back with the Adams family and uh, just has so much experience. Um, and bring such uh, personality to her roles. Um, you know, she's uh, funny, she's relatable, uh, and um, she's also just like, you know, deeply in touch with her emotions and is able to, uh, you know, within one scene kind of hit all kinds of different emotional beats in a way that's really stunning. And it's really, as, you know, director, just like a dream kind of person to work with um in addition to just being a really sweet genuine nice person which is always a bonus you know it's like if that's not necessary in order to make a movie but it's it's kind of just a like a extra blessing to be able to work with someone who's just like such a just a genuinely good person um so you know the movie takes place in the 50s like i said and and she just has like this great look that kind of is adaptable to any era. And she just really, you know, when we put her in like these 50s outfits it, and on these 50s sets, everything just really felt right, um, just aesthetically. And then the fact that she's also just able to knock it out of the park emotionally um, was great. And um, so, so yeah, it's kind of like, she's definitely, it's, she really carries the movie. She's in 
pretty much, I think almost every single scene of the movie. Um, and then also, you know, it's, uh, her Santino Bernard, who plays her little boy, uh, they have a lot of really good emotional scenes together. And I think the fact that Christina comes from a child acting background was, she was really able to put Santino at ease um, and they had a great time together. They had like a really strong bond. They had, they were always laughing on set. Like that was important to me for Santino to like have a good time. He's a little kid. I don't want him stressed out about stuff. We're making like this heavy movie. Um, but she was really able to help him have like a playful experience. And I really, uh, you know, they were really able to create like a believable on screen um, uh, mother and son. And then the rest of the cast was, was rounded out with some really strong supporting people um you know it's like i said it's mostly this mom and her kid but then we had these supporting people coming in and out uh all kind of like pushing laura's buttons laura our main character played by christina all kind of testing her in in one way or another antagonizing her um and uh and and so yeah we were able to pull together like a, a really fun cast yeah for sure uh, as you said, the film deals with heavy emotional subjects such as abuse, isolation, and more. Uh, what were some of the challenges to adapting a story like that that has so many emotional moments such as this film? Um, I really like, I, I feel like tackling emotions is overall like a big challenge to try to, um, and I, it's one that I really like to do. I like to take big swings to try to get like really emotional scenes um, rather than trying to play it cool and like trying to like play it safe and not go there. Um, and, and I think like the challenges of that is uh, just audiences are so sophisticated as far as, I don't even mean intellectually, because um, I always, I see this movie as much more in the way we were making it, what we we're always talking about, it was always more emotion than like intellectualizing the whole thing. Because ultimately, there's a purity to the the story that to me is reminiscent of like a fairy tale. So the emotions were always like very important, and so I think audiences are very keen or are very quick to to latch on to something that feels emotionally inauthentic, you know. Especially when you have like a kid in there or you're dealing with a parent kid relationship. In so many movies, you know, even great ones, like you'll see like a parent and a kid, and like you know, it, it doesn't have any. It doesn't feel like these people even know each other or that like kids act like that or like parents act like that. So I think, you know, again, it's not like, you know, there is the abstraction of like, I feel like this is a fairy tale. So it's not like we're trying to make like a gritty, like family drama of what it's really like to be in a family. There's always going to be like a layer of like abstraction. So I guess like that's to me, like trying to get like the emotional truths within sort of a fantastical story um, and I guess that all to me comes down to the the cast and then being able to pull it off. And I feel like my cast was like more than able to like really, you know, make that stuff believable. Yeah, for sure. Uh, which films would you say have influenced you the most uh, for a film like this one? Um, it's interesting. I have, I have so many like countless like uh, influences on me as a filmmaker. Um, I think like what I was directly influenced on this movie was more of like, I really like looked into like um, advertising from the 1950s, um, like catalogs and commercials. There's even like a, there, something that was built into the script that I was always like really attracted to was that there's this commercial that replays throughout the movie um, that's kind of becomes like a mantra in the character's head of, you know, this selling this uh, hot point dishwasher which was like something like that was being sold to women at the time, like, oh, to have be this perfect 50s housewife, you have to have this stuff. You know, she looks at catalogs, you know, that are telling her how to dress and all this stuff. So like really diving into um, not necessarily movies that were made in the 50s, but the advertising from the 50s and also the music from the 50s, which we were lucky enough um, to have some really great 50 songs in there that for a while, it didn't look like we were going to be able to afford them, but we were somehow able to pull that off. Um, so, so yeah, so for this one, like, I feel like the touchstone was, was, was more that the, the world of fifties advertising, the colors, uh, and the aesthetic and the, the layer, the, the kind of like the illusion of perfection that those advertisements were selling people basically, I think was the main like visual 
uh, influence on, on the movie. Awesome. Switching over a little bit to the horror side of uh, this story, can you tell us how you and your team uh, created the look for the monster in this film? Yeah, it's this. it was fun. Part of what was fun about the look of the monster in this is that it's a shape-shifting sort of a creature. It's amorphous. It comes out of the water, and it also can return to the water. So that was really fun to where we came up with a bunch of different designs and then kind of cherry picked the things that we liked the best from each of them. Um, you know, we'd have like kind of like a monster movie within the movie that we shot that was really kind of like rooted in like creature from the black lagoon. Um, and, uh, and so I think just starting with the idea that this thing, um, it's a little hard to talk about without giving away too much, but the, the monster is kind of unique, like a ghost sort of a monster thing that's based out of water and can take the shape of different, uh, of different forms, you know? Uh, and so had um, really cool uh, team that was able to, um, you know, a lot of trial and error and also like looking at photos of uh, like, uh, like, there's these things called like bog corpses and whatnot of like these these uh basically like people who have died in water and like almost preserved by the water uh and then just like the sludginess of of water which then turns into other forms that then take shape um it was just a lot of like a, a lot of trial and error and a lot of stuff that never made it into the movie um before we kind of landed on uh, the different looks that our that our creature would take. Right on. You both write and direct movies, and sometimes both. Is there one part of the process you enjoy more than the other? I really like going back and forth between them um, because uh, directing a movie takes or like a really long time from the time pre production, seeing it all the way through to post production, and then the release. It's like it's a really long time period. Um, and writing, I can kind of go in, in and out and, um, like within the time that I worked on this movie, I wrote, a, uh, a bunch of different projects. Um, so, but at the same time, if I was only writing, um, you know, I would, you know, and I didn't have the outlet of getting to direct, you know, I, so I feel that I think I would get frustrated with that. So I feel like, uh, um, writing, um, really helps me, uh, when I write, cause I also, I write for other people. And my directing experience, I feel like really helps me understanding like the kind of their budget parameters, the practicalities of production and whatnot. Um, and then like with this, it was great because this was a script that came to me that I just connected with right away. And I didn't write it, but I, I saw like how my sensibilities could work with it. Um, so, so yeah, I feel like, um, uh, and, and also uh, the writing and directing is like different parts of my personality. You know, um, when I write, I kind of go into very much like more interior mode and then I get very comfortable there, like just, you know, being by myself, but then directing pulls me out of that and it's so social and, and having to communicate um, with a full team to really, we all bring something to life together. Um, so they're, they're very different processes that I, I feel lucky that I'm able to, to work in both both worlds um, to have like some sort of a balance, you know? Right. Um, your films have a wide range of styles. I mean, All Trillers Die is really a fast paced kind of fun movie. This one's a little bit more of a slow burn. Uh, what do you look for when either picking or writing a film? Really some something, it could be different things. I, like I was saying, a lot of it comes back to like some sort of emotional core, like if cheerleaders, for example, uh the relationship of like the 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 uh the witch girl i guess you would call her and the cheerleader that she's in love with like that like there was just like a very strong like sweet emotional core between them and then there's all the zaniness around around it um i really like that um and uh so and then this is like they the, have the emotional core of the mother and the son but then there's kind of a more serious thing around it um, I'm attracted to like each, each of them equally, but I think like, yeah, having some sort of emotional foundation to where the characters I care about, no matter how wild or how like, quote unquote, like normal the story is going to be like, that's, that's always something that, that I spark to. Um, and then sometimes it could be like, there's like a, like a specific set piece or something that it's like, wow, that, that's really 
interesting and like that's enough to build a whole movie out of or a character um but but yeah i think ultimately i'd say like the the emotional core of it and if i can relate to it and then the challenges of like trying to make other people relate to it like without cheerleaders in spite of the fact that like the situation is so heightened you know yeah absolutely so what, what are you working on next is there anything that you can uh talk about now that you're working on that we might see in the future uh different writing projects i'm not sure what's next directing um and i'm also in the process of uh uh remastering my first movie which is called the lost totally different than monstrous it's very very violent and aggressive and kind of mean i guess uh and uh but anyway that that anchor bay put that out um back in the day and the rights have come back to us so um like doing like you know building up like to like a full like 4k re-release on that and that's been kind of fun to go back um to try to like something that really meant a lot to me uh, when I was first starting out and try to like properly put it out into the world again. Awesome. And is there anything else you'd like to promote media, social media that people can reach you or another project going on these days? Uh, not at the moment. I'm not, yeah, I'm kind of in the, the you know, laying low, you know, uh, trying to like basically in the lab, trying to create some more stuff to, <laughs> to bring out into the world. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, and, and happy that, um, you know, Monstrous is, get, is getting a nice release and getting some nice attention. Um, and, uh, you know, really just, like I said, excited to have gotten the chance to work with Christina and uh, really proud of the work that she did, you know, above all in, in this thing. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Monstrous comes out this Friday, May 13th, uh, in theaters and on demand. I've seen it. There's a lot of great stuff about it. You need to watch it. So thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you so much. Good to talk to you.